since 2006, American Archives Month have given this profession an opportunity to show or remind people that items that are important to them are being preserved, and that's what we do here. We preserve items. Cataloged, cared for, and made accessible by archivists, like you, whom you just met. Each October, the Hall of Records selects one topic to focus on. Some of our past exhibits have included the Underground Railroad, the South Mall, the historic flooding in Albany, and the Civil War. However, this year for Archives Month, our focus will be on Albany breweries and how beer affected Albany and how Albany affected beer. The, typically, this is not a topic that would associate with government archives. But surprisingly enough, the Hall of Records has a great deal of information on breweries that date back to the mid-17th century. The first mention in, of breweries in our records come from our Dutch records, and we do have a lot of Dutch records that are stored here. And when you take the tour, you will see that uh, one of the buildings, we call the building within the building, it's, 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 a, it's an, uh, a specialized building that preserves the records uh, through temperature controlled facility. It's really a neat piece that you're going to enjoy seeing. We have the very first deed book for this area. In the, in the deed book it names such as Cornelius Van Ness, Philip Hendricks, Peter Bronk, Hendrik Andriessen, Franz Bartensen Pastor are mentioned as owning or selling breweries. At any given time in Albany, during Dutch time, there were six to ten breweries in operation here. In more modern times, our records on breweries include blueprints, permits, building surveys, chattel mortgages, photographs, circuit court minutes, water usage. Believe it or not, they kept track of their water usage back then in these breweries. While each of, of these on its own is important to the history of Albany, these records begin to tell a story. So with that, uh, I will now pass the podium over to our guest speaker. He is the founder of the Albany Ale Project, the co-author of the Upper Valley Beer, and an all-around New York beer history person, it is my honor, privilege, and, pr and pleasure to present to all of you, and it says nerd on here, but I can't say that. <laughs> I am. Don't worry It's my honor, privilege, and pleasure to present to all of you today our guest speaker, uh, Craig Gravina. Craig, thank you. Well, thank you. I, I am honestly shocked at the turnout. Uh, today. Normally it's m m me talking to my wife in the kitchen and she's rolling her eyes, so to see this many people to come out in the middle of the day, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by this. And I, and I want to thank everybody here that, that, that especially Rebecca, that, that put this all together to have me come in and talk to you guys. Um, I want to give you a little background on myself. I, I am not a trained historian. That's why I refer to myself as a beer history nerd, because that's really what I am. You know, I, uh, about 10 years ago, I started writing a blog on the internet about beer, not necessarily history, and that uh, evolved into writing about, uh, about the history of beer, and then specifically the history of beer in Albany and the Upper Hudson Valley. And that came about because um, uh, I ran across another blog post from another blogger, right? We decided, well, I decided to start looking into what other people were writing about. And uh, this guy up in Canada wrote uh, a, a blog post about finding an article for Albany Ale in uh, Newfoundland in the 1840s. And he basically said, what the heck is Albany Ale? And I contacted him and I said, hey, I live in Albany. I'm interested in beer and I'm interested in history. Let's see if we can discover what this is. And that really was the start of all of this. Now, like I said, I'm not a trained historian. I'm definitely not an archivist. Um, but what I'm really interested in is less this brewery was at this location and this brewery made this amount of beer. What I'm really interested in is contextualizing beer and brewing within the greater history. And in the introduction, he hit, he hit on a, a little bit about how far back brewing in Albany goes. Um, and it, a lot of that has to do with the culture in this area during the 17th century as well. So we really are looking at this span of 400 years that kicks off um, the, the brewing industry in Albany and the Upper Hudson Valley. 
And it, it's a unique situation. Um, if we talk about what's happening in, 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 in New Netherland and in, in Beverwijk in 1650 and compare that to what's happening in uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony or let's say Virginia. I have a good friend who is the director of Foodways down at Colonial Williamsburg and I contacted him and I said, I said, hey Frank, um, just, and he's a big beer guy. He's actually the guy that interprets brewing for Colonial Williamsburg. And, uh, you know, wears the outfit and the getup and everything and, and, and makes 17th century Virginia beer, actually British beer. And I said to him, hey, uh, Frank, just out of curiosity, how many breweries were operating in Williamsburg uh, or uh, the upper plantation between 1650 and 1700? And he. <coughs> kind of hemmed and hawed, and he got back to me, and he finally said, well, we know of one that was at the College of William and Mary, and we know that there, we think that there may have been a second somewhere outside the city at some given time. Compared to that, as we were talking, anywhere between six and 12 breweries operating in that same exact period, not just in the city of Albany, but really in the greater colony of, of Rensselaerswijk. And that's where it all starts, right? This <coughs> develops. The, 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 the tradition of beer drinking that the Dutch develop continues on when the British take over in 1664. And it continues on as we go through the 18th century to the turn of the 19th century and then the Industrial Revolution and the, and the development of large-scale brewing operations within the city, which are at that point let's say from 1825 to 1860, this is really one of the major brewing centers in North America. You have, or I'll say the United States, there is some, uh, some brewing centers in Canada too, Montreal uh, probably being the, the next biggest one. But you have in the United States, Philadelphia, New York City, and Albany. And comparatively speaking, right, Albany is the smallest of those two population centers. But from very early on, we see that there is a difference between Dutch culture and, and the British culture that's happening in our next closest colony, which is the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, the patroon is actually the one who sort of kicks off this whole thing. Does everybody understand the concept of a patroonship? We hear about patroons a lot, but we don't really understand what a patroon is. So uh, in New Netherland, we had the Dutch West India Company come to the New World and establish up here, Fort Nassau, and then later, um, what would become New Amsterdam. Fort Nassau becomes Fort Orange and then eventually becomes Beverwijk, right? It's controlled, it's not controlled by the crown of the Netherlands, it's controlled by essentially the GE of the 17th century. It's a company, right? They're here to exploit the beaver trade. Um, and it, for a long time, the area stays as just a, 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 a trading posts. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is that life is pretty good in the Netherlands in the 17th century. So what ends up happening, this guy named Killian Van Rensselaer, who is a member, he's a, on the board of directors of the Dutch West India Company, says, I tell you what, if you give me land, I will secure people to come over and settle in the New World. But I want to have autonomy in my colony. So he establishes this colony within a colony of Rensselaerswijk within the greater New Netherland colony. And he has to establish sort of an autonomous, semi-autonomous government of his own that he controls. He's got to play by the by the company's rules because he is a member, he's a board member, but he really wants to control everything that is made and everything that is produced and, and that comes back and forth. He wants to make money. It's a business opportunity for him. And he, uh, his first, it's a, it's a position called a shoat, which is essentially like a sheriff, a magistrate, uh, an accountant, and an overseer for everything. He uh, appoints this guy named Jacob Plankett, and he gives him the authority to start a brewery and to distill and make beer on behalf of, of, of himself, of his grain, the, the, the patroon's grain that's being grown. And he writes in a letter in 1632 and he says, as soon as there is a crop of grain to grow, I want to build a brewery and supply the entire colony of New Netherland with beer. And he goes about doing that. What's unusual about that is that the first brewery doesn't actually open, or the first brewery of record that we know of, doesn't open until the 1640s. And it, is, it opens, and Van Rensselaer contracts with a brewer named Everett Pels because everybody in the colony is already brewing, and he's not making any money off of it. So he opens a colonial brewery that is to supply everyone in at least Rensselaerswijk in 1642. 
What ends up happening, though, is he dies in 1643, and his kids are too young to take over his, the patroonship. They are technically the patroon, but he has proxies. His wife administers from, from Amsterdam. He does not live, he's not, he never lives in the colony. And then he's got a few proxies that work here. Aaron Van Curler is actually one of them later on. Um, from the 1640s into 1650s, there's a lot of things going on, and what ends up happening is you have brewers that start moving into the area. The area is no longer necessarily under the thumb of the patroon, so they start opening breweries. There's also a conflict between the company and between what's happening, uh, the settlements that are happening outside Fort Orange. Peter Stuyvesant comes up in the 1650s and says, enough of this, we're going to establish handlers in Yonkers Street, and this is the center of town. We're going to put the church right in the center of town. Today, that's uh, Broadway and State Street, where that intersects, down by the D&H building. <coughs> and he says, Beverwijk is now under the control of the Dutch West India Company. So you have all these brewers that can come in. They don't have to give... The, the, they're still renting land from the, from the patroon, but they don't have to give them their shares of, of wheat and all that kind of stuff. And so you start seeing all of these breweries start popping up by the 1650s. So many so that we have breweries as we continue into the 18th century of the same brewers' families that are opening in the 1640s, 1650s, and 1660s are still operating in the 1760s, 1770s, 1780s, 90s. And the longest running one at that point would be uh, the Gansfort Brewery, Gansfort, New York. Gansfort was Peter Gansfort's sort of retirement area up in Saratoga County. His family had been brewing for about 150 years prior to that. He was a hero of the American Revolution. He was the defender of Fort Stanwix, and he was also a brewer. In the 1690s, we've seen, court, uh, we've seen uh, records in uh, New York City of uh, brewers in Albany. In fact, the, the, the uh, um, Albany Common Council Ask uh, and there's mention back there of um, Albert Yance Reichman, who will eventually become the mayor of the city of Albany, uh, to pay the city clerk of New York City in two pipes of essentially what is table beer. Table beer is sort of a, a medium-strength beer. And in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th century, there was only really three kinds of beer. There was small beer, there was table beer, and there was strong beer. It could be dark, it could be light. Anybody know why they have basically three different levels of beer? Anybody have any idea? Men, women, and children. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody really sort of drank, right? That was part of it, and I'll talk about that in a second, too. Well, we'll talk about that, too. Taxation? It, was a pro it has something to do with taxation, but it's really more of a monetary thing. It's a way so everyone can have access to beer. If you make small beer that's not very strong, it, it is... It, you are using the same grain to make strong beer that you would do to make uh, uh, small beer. You're just running more water through the grain. So the weaker stuff, they can charge less money for. The stronger stuff, they can charge more money for. So rich people can get drunk and poor people can get drunk. <laughs> but not as drunk. Right. But not as well. They need to buy more of it. So to talk about, there is a few myths about colonial. And I don't want to just talk about colonial beer, but there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, there's a few myths about that, and one of them was that you couldn't drink the water, right? So the Europeans that came here were very nervous about drinking water because they're coming from Europe where the water had been fouled. When they get here, they realize that the water's not that bad. But what's more important about beer is that it was a nutritional supplement, right? So uh, especially in the, in the 17th century when you have the Little Ice Age, right, where it's cold in July and June, Crops aren't growing very well. You can't get good game, especially deep winter at any, any year, whether there's a little ice age or not, right? So they're using, grain, they're using beer as, grain, as a grain storage method, and they're also using it as a way to augment their, uh, their diets. And you see that no matter where you are. You see beer being, if you're in Virginia, you see beer being drink for nutrition. If you're in Massachusetts Bay Colony and, and Massachusetts, you see that as well. And you see it in, definitely in New Netherland. And there's also one other major important thing that the Dutch really like about beer. And that is you can get really drunk on beer. <laughs> the beer that they drank traditionally, right, the, the best end was strong stuff, over 10%. And this... Makes, uh, this is a big difference between what's happening culturally in, in, in Massachusetts. Massachusetts are drinking it because they, the Massachusetts, the Pilgrims, and the Puritans, and even the people that are moving west into central Massachusetts, whose 
um, identity and their um, uh, sort of so social functions revolve around the church, they're not all so great about it. they're not they're, they're not crazy about getting drunk right but they but they do like the fact that they can drink beer and they're not getting sick and they're not starving to death the dutch however even the earliest dutch that are coming here they're sailors and they're fur trappers they're less concerned with the church they're very happy to get drunk and be happy and also not die <laughs> so that's a it's a cultural difference between two areas that are very close to each other so we have this establishment of, of, of beer making in the, uh, in the 17th and early 18th century. And as we move into the end of the, the 18th century, um, we're getting more and more British folks moving. Scottish, Irish, British. Right? What beer was made out of up until about 19, or excuse me, 1800, predominantly, was wheat. All right? Wheat grew very, very well in the Hudson Valley. Barley did not and does not grow very well. It's not a very good climate for barley. Most of the barley that's being used right now in American craft beer is being grown in Canada. So what ends up happening is we have these sort of old Dutch traditions that are with strong beer, getting drunk, wheat-based wheat beer. And yet we have British folk that are coming over here who are used to drinking barley-based beer. A lot of wheat beer is being made in Europe at this time, too. Re wheat is not an uncommon beer, or uncommon grain to, to see, and that's why you have the Rheinheitsgebot. boat. It's a tax dodge. It's, it's so that the aristocracy in Germany can get, can get the wheat to make wheat beer. Northern Europe is all sort of very similar in its drinking habits at the, in, the, in the 18th, 17th and 18th century. In the 1750s, you start seeing Scots coming in more and more, and they bring in a, a new variety of what's called four row, six row, or they called it bigger burl barley. And it's a winter variety of barley, and it does fairly well in cold winter climates and then somewhat humid climates in the spring, right? It's perfect for New York. But it doesn't take off until about 1800, right? Because there is this old... Dutch tradition. And you, a lot of the breweries that are operating at this point by 1790, 1800 are still Dutch. The Gansforts don't close their brewery until 1805. That thing had been operating since the 1650s or 1670s. So uh, you have this switch in the grain. And we actually, the records over at the Albany Institute have uh, the precursor of the Institute, sort of a, a think tank that was happening in, uh, in the 1790s. There was a guy that writes an article about pushing for more barley brewing and more hops growing in New York. The hops industry, uh, prior to the development of the New York hops industry, was north of Boston, around the Gloucester area. So we were importing hops for beer that was being made here, that was being traded up and down <coughs> the Hudson Valley. So now we're getting a switch from, from wheat-based beer to barley-based beer, right? And that becomes real popular. We see in newspaper ad advertisements around 1790 to 1805, the people are actively asking for barley. Barley, do you have barley? We have barley. We'll buy your hops, we'll buy your barley. You don't see very much uh, wheat, rye, spelt being sold. At that point, I mean, you, see, you do see some brewing records that do mention wheat or whatever, but everything is starting to shift over. Beer, however, is still staying strong. So whereas we got this Scottish influx in the 1750s, we see that continue way all the way into the beginning of the 19th century. You know, we have a, 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 um, a statue in Washington Park of Robert Burns that was put in by the St. Andrews Society in the 1880s or whatever. And that's a nod to Albany's early Scottish roots. And most of the brewers that are coming in at the, in the beginning of the 19th century are Scottish. We have Dunlips. We have uh, Amsdell. We have, um, i got to think of some of the other Scottish <laughs> names, uh, Burl, McLish. Uh, we start seeing all of these Scottish side sounding names. All of the Dutch families have, they've diversified. They've gone into other things or they're just living off the money that they have now. They're, they're rich aristocracy. And we have these younger brewers coming in. You know, and I, and I want to go back to the, to the Dutch uh, one minute too. There's a misconception that you, you know, you're a settler, you come to, to the new world, and uh, you're a brewer, and it's a hard scrabble world. And yeah, early on it is, but most of these brewers, these Dutch brewers that came in, got wealthy very, very quickly, right? It's a product that everybody wanted, right? So we have 
uh, I mentioned uh, Reichman is the mayor of, of the city of Albany by, he's like the ninth mayor by the early 1700s, 1708, 1709. There's a tra tradition of politics and beer in Albany. Um, we have Michael Nolan was a mayor, he was the owner of Bevervite. We have John Taylor was a mayor, he was the owner of Taylor and Sons Brewing Company. We have Dan O'Connell who ran the Democratic machine in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and you know, he owned Hedrick. Um, so we have this tradition of politics. You don't see that in a lot of other cities. You know, if you go to Buffalo, Buffalo's got a big brewing industry and they have a Teutonic German late 19th century and they had their own political power within their own circles, but they didn't have this sort of expansive political power that you see with breweries. And to, uh, to go back, it, again, that ties in directly to the longevity of brewing in the city of Albany. So let's get us back up to the early 19th century. So we have the development of these breweries. We have this infrastructure that's already been set up. We have farms. We have grain that's being grown. We have the hops industry that's starting to pop up in the central part of the state. And so we're, we're all ready to go. We're all ready to become a fully functioning, modern brewing city. And there's one thing that happens that solidifies everything, and everything comes together. Can anybody, off the top of their head, think of what it is? What's that? The canal. The Erie Canal is exactly what makes Albany what it is when it comes to beer. And it's not because the beer that's being made here, starting in... You know, the, this, this Albany ale that we start seeing more and more of, this strong beer that is being exported. It's not going down the canal, right? There's nothing down the canal to send it to early on, except farms, and farms grow raw ingredients. You have Genesee wheat. Later on, you have Midwest, Genesee, excuse me, Genesee cereal grains and wheats and barleys. Later on, you have the Midwest. You have hops in central New York. All of that stuff starts coming down the canal to the breweries in Albany, the, the breweries in Albany start making it, making beer, and then they send it down the, the Hudson River to New York City, and then it goes everywhere. One of the big boons for, for Albany, along with the canal, is that New York City, at the beginning of the 19th century, has fouled its water, right? It's the same situation that London was in 150 years earlier, right? So they stop really making beer. They get a lot of their beer from Albany and the Hudson Valley. Probably the best example of how the canal worked with the brewing industry comes from Matthew Vassar, Vassar College. Vassar was a brewer. That's how he got the money to build the college. In the 1840s, he writes a letter asking for uh, a malt house to supply him with, or asking when the malt house could, could, could get his, their grain to him so that he could send his, um, his steamboat to Albany to pick it up. Now, Vassar's in Poughkeepsie, 90 miles south of here, 90 minutes south of here. The malt house was in Mohawk, New York, going out towards Utica. So we're talking about a 150-mile trip. And the, in the letter, they're talking about having that shipment within three days. So that's the speed that Albany could get its raw ingredients. And Matthew Vassar is considered an Albany ale brewer. Uh, the Upper Hudson Valley sort of colloquially becomes known as the Albany, Air, uh, the Albany Ale Brewing Center. So as, these, as the raw ingredients can now come to the city, the breweries get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the best example of that is John Taylor, who will eventually become a mayor. There's a whole big deal with John Taylor in the 1930s about adulterating his beer with bad... And I, I would love to be able to get into this whole story, but it's, it's such a rabbit hole. If, if somebody wants to talk to me about it later, I'd be happy to tell you that whole story. But what Taylor does is Taylor is really the first brewer to take advantage of the canal. He's partnered with his brother-in-law, and their brewery by the 1820s has the ability to produce about 50,000 barrels of beer a year. In the 1850s, he opens another brewery. Um, it's about down where the U-Haul uh, building is today. That brewery by 1850 could produce 200,000 barrels of beer a year. So we have one brewery in town. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that every year he made 200,000 barrels of beer a year, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that other breweries around the area were making 40 to 50 to 100 were making that amount. Every year it varied. But we're talking about a good number of breweries by the mid-19th century producing, you know, minimally 40 to 50,000 barrels. There, there's Albany... Albany was a large city at that time. Even in the, in the mid-19th century, Albany was a pretty decent-sized city. But we didn't have enough population to sustain that much beer. 
So the beer was going other places, and it wasn't just going to New York City. It was going to Boston, and it was going to Washington, D.C. By 1805, we see Albany beer in Washington, D.C. The earliest mention of Albany Ale that we see is about 1805. We see it advertised, something called Albany Ale, being advertised in New York City newspapers. Within that same year as the Washington, D.C., we see it in Charleston. Later on, very shortly thereafter, we see it in New Orleans. By mid-century, we're seeing it in California, Sacramento, San Francisco. Uh, by 1858, it's in Suriname. By that same year, it's in Hawaii. Right? Wow. So it's going everywhere. The breweries are now getting fairly large. But the canal, just as much as it was a boon for the breweries, it eventually will become sort of its detriment. Because what ends up happening is you have people coming to Albany. They're not staying in Albany. They leave and they go west. And when they go west, they have no competition. So they can start opening their own, brewery, their own breweries out there. And at first you have Scottish and English breweries opening out there. There's a few, uh, a few of them that you see in Utica and a few that you see in Buffalo. But shortly by the, mid, by the late 19th century or mid-late 19th century, you start seeing the German in, influx coming from um, Central Europe. And they're going out there. They're bringing their newfangled lager with them, which is a cold conditioned beer. And I'll explain what Albany Ale was, too. The other thing that you have happening is that by the mid to late 19th century, we fought a war. War generally isn't very good for beer, and it wasn't very good for the Albany Brewers because the Union and Confederate armies, I don't want to say unbeknownst to each other, but uh, in a race with each other, started establishing the rail system in the United States. Right? Almost as soon as the canal opens, you have railroads competing with it. When you have railroads that are now expanding all over the country by the 1870s, you could be some tiny little town in western New York that can get grain and hops in regularly. You don't have to rely on the canals. You don't have to rely on the feeder canals. Albany, that at one time having a lock on, on distribution, now is playing the same game as everybody else. So let's talk a little bit about what Albany Ale was. So Albany Ale's, the hallmark of Albany Ale is that it was exported. Right? You don't see the exportation of beer in other brewing centers. Even as you get to the mid-19th uh, century when you're talking about other, the lager breweries that are popping up in, in Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, Toledo, Chicago, get going out west. They're all regional breweries that are supplying local regional areas. It's not until the end of the 19th century that you start seeing Jacob Best, who becomes Paps, uh, brewery and Anheuser-Busch where they're getting big and they're starting having refrigerated rail cars and it's not until that. Albany is exporting beer a hundred years earlier than that. So that's sort of a uniqueness to what Albany Ale was. The other part of Albany Ale is that going back to that strong beer tradition of the Dutch, we know that in the, 19, in the 1830s there was a doctor, a, a chemist in Albany that analyzes Albany Ale and compares it to other beer of the time, European beer and some American beer. And he does it on behalf of the, uh, the temperance movement. He doesn't do it on, on their behalf, but they have a tendency to, to glom onto this. They know that in the 1840s, 1850s, and 1860s, Albany Ale, in barrels, was 7.67% alcohol. And in bottles, it was nine. Uh, it was ten point seven something. Right, that's a high end. Here's the thing: for years and years and years, I I did exactly what all of the newspapers and all the publications that talked about Albany Ale did. I proliferated those numbers. The problem with it was, and it was always there, and I always knew it. I just never put two and two together. In the 19th century, and early 20th century, beer was measured in alcohol by weight, not alcohol by volume. So if you want to figure out the conversion between alcohol by weight and alcohol by volume is you take those numbers and you multiply them by one and a quarter. Meaning, Albany Ale at the low end in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s was about 9.5%. And on the high end, it was about 13.5%. So even stronger than we thought. That, that changes over time. We see by newspaper accounts, there's an article in the 1870s that was written about, written, talking about Massachusetts beer, comparing that to Albany. And 
At that point, you're looking at the high end being about 10% and the low end being about 7.5%. If you look at the Amsdale uh, brewery records that the Albany Institute uh, actually has now, and there's actually some really great uh, blueprints back in the exhibit, uh, the beer, the low end was around 5% and the high end was about 7.5%. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing this degradation down. Um, by the end of the 19th century, Going into the 20th century, there are about 11 breweries operating in Albany. There's about 11 bre well, there's about nine breweries operating in Troy. There's a few in Schenectady. Uh, at the height, the Upper Hudson Valley between Albany, Troy, Hudson, Schenectady, uh, some of the smaller areas had about 40 or 50 breweries operating. Um, by this point, we're still we're still doing pretty good. We're still in our 20s, um, and then prohibition hits. And this area, whether you're in Troy, whether you're in Albany, you're seeing about the same attrition rate as you would see for the rest of the country. It was about a 75% closure. Uh, we have Beverwick survives. Um, Beverwick and Quinn and Nolan were two large breweries actually right down the road. This is actually a, one of the brewing centers of, of Albany. Albany's got three or four brewing centers. Uh, North Albany, this area right here, has a, a, a high level of breweries in it. Uh, Center Square had a pretty good number of breweries in it. The old Dutch breweries were all down by the river on Broadway. And then the south end uh, is where John Taylor and Albany Brewing Company, and there was some German breweries down there as well. Um, so we have about three breweries that survive. We have Beverwick uh, and Quinn and Nolan. They conglomerate into one giant brewery, Beverwick Brewery Industries. Uh, they survive because they are the biggest regional brewery, right? They're really the only ones that can compete on a semi-national level at that point. Uh, we have Dobler Brewery, which survives. Dobler survives because it gets bought right before Prohibition by a, a Newark, New Jersey outfit. They close the brewery in, New in Newark to produce ice and coal and all that kind of stuff, and they keep the Albany branch open making near beer. Um, and then we have Hedrick Brewery, and Hedrick Brewery survives because it's owned by the, you know, like maybe not at the time it wasn't owned by him, but later it's owned by the, the head of the Democratic Party in Albany County. So those are our three breweries. They all continue to operate up until the 1960s. Um, Beverwick as a facility, as, as Beverwick closes in 1950, it gets bought by Schaefer Brewing Company. Schaefer was a big brewery in, in Brewer, Brooklyn that it, actually is in Manhattan first and then it moves out to Brooklyn. Um, they had exceeded their capacity so they come up here and they buy that brewery. And, um, by the mid-1960s, uh, O'Connell had sold off Hedrick. The beer still gets made into the 1990s. Uh, Dobler, Dobler had closed. Uh, they eventually tear down Dobler when they build the Empire State Plaza. Um, uh, Beverwick, uh, Schaefer continues to brew up until about 1970. They had big plans to build another brewery and have a plant in Albany and have a plant in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, and they built the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania plant and said, that's a new modern brewery. We're going to close down the 110-year-old brewery. So. Um, so we, in Albany, by about 1972, there are no operating breweries. This is the only gap in the time in the city of Albany where there are no breweries operating. Uh, in 1980, 1981, we have a, a, a guy, Bill Newman. Yeah. Um, Bill is, uh, it was funny, I was doing a talk at the Albany Institute a couple years ago, not a couple years ago now, probably eight or nine years ago, and I was talking about Bill, and I'd never met Bill, and we're having this conversation, and I said, I don't even know if Bill is alive or dead, and somebody in the back goes, he's right here. <laughs> so uh, I got to know Bill. Uh, you know, Bill, Bill was, uh, he worked for the Department of Taxation and Finance, right? He's, uh, he he uh, was, was interested in, in Irish... Moorish dancing, folk dance, not Irish, excuse me, English folk dancing, and his buddies that he did that with, oh, well, they liked imported British beer, and, and Bill said, all right, I'm going to learn how to make beer, and he went to England and spent some time in England and, and, and tutored under this guy, Peter Austin, who's sort of the father of the independent breweries uh, in sort of, sort of the early craft beer movement in, in England, and he came back and he went to a metal fabricator in Schenectady and had them build all the equipment. That was part of the agreement that he had with, with uh, Peter Austin was that, they, that Peter would give him plans to build a brewery. And he started producing Newmans. And I'm sure there's people in here that had Newmans and tried Newmans and, and uh, you know, it was fairly successful. Um, what his legacy is, more so than being a brewery, I mean, he was the first uh, 
what we would consider a micro boutique brewery on the East Coast, actually really east of the Rocky Mountains. His real legacy was, though, in order to sort of make ends meet, he started developing programs and teaching people how to operate breweries and how to, not necessarily how to brew, but how to, how to make it a viable business plan. And you started getting all these people coming in that wanted to open other breweries. And the most significant of those was a guy from Boston. Um, Jim Cook came here, took some of his classes, said, he's on to something. I think I've got some money and I can expand on that. He would eventually go to open up uh, the Boston Beer Company, which is Sam Adams, um, which is the largest craft brewery, in, which is sort of an oxymoron. But he's also, Jim Cook's also a billionaire now, so he did something right. Uh, Bill shut down in the early 1990s. Um, you know, he had kids going to college and it just wasn't working the way that he wanted it to work. And at that point, we started seeing brew pubs opening up. Uh, Browns and Troy was the first one. Right around the same time that Bill closed, Browns opened up. We had the Big House Brewing Company, which was, I worked at the Big House Brewing Company doing all their advertising way back when. Uh, that was my first foray into learning about the history of beer in, in the city of Albany. Um, and then, you know, we've had this boom in the last 10 years of craft breweries, craft ciders, craft distilleries all opening up. And it's, uh, you know, it's funny, as, as much as Albany has had uh, this huge 400-year history, uh, we're still trying to get new breweries in and still trying to, 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 you know, be on the forefront of beer making. And uh, That's about it. That's about, that's about the long and short of the 400 years of... Does anybody have any questions? That's my favorite part is the question and answer part. So you said that uh, beer was being sent all over the country right. from Albany. How would they send? Would it be in barrels and would it last that long? It was actually sent in bottles. Uh, most of the oh. stuff, I mean, they did send stuff in barrels too. And mm -hmm. beer would last. So ale, ale production, the difference between ale and lager is ale is an older process. It's a warm fermentation process, right? You don't need refrigeration. Lager development and lager brewing takes off at the end of the 19th century because of commercial refrigeration. It predates that. Germans and Europeans were going into caves and storing their beer. But what happens with lager is once you brew it, you have to keep it cold or it goes bad. In ale, you have British breweries that would take their porter and their strong ales and their stock ales and put it in the brewery yard and just let it sit out in these barrels and it change in temperature and it would, it would change sort of like wine you know, changes, port changes over time. It's the same thing with beer. So it, it appears that the majority of what was being sent abroad was actually being sent in bottles. Okay. Um, and it was being, it was basically the route was ingredients come to Albany, beer's made in Albany, goes down to New York City, and then goes out from there. Sometimes it would go up into Connecticut on the Connecticut River. Sometimes it would travel down the coast and go in the Potomac to to Washington, or sometimes it would end up going down. Now, here's the other thing. If you have beer that's going to Hawaii by the 1850s, is that going by train? It can go by train to some point, but at some point you have to wait for the Transcontinental Railroad. It can't go across the, the Isthmus, it can't go through the Panama Canal. Panama Canal hasn't been built. So is it, be, is it going all the way down around South America and up that way? That we don't know. But we know it's there. It's not there in great quantities, but we're seeing between eight, like 1858 and 1860, we're seeing fairly regular advertisements for it. And we see it, like I said, in Suriname and in Spanish or whatever they speak in Suriname. I don't know, but we're seeing it, you know, we, we're clearly seeing advertisements for it. Any other questions? Would we recognize the old Dutch beer as beer today? Would it, do you know what it would taste? Is it anything like what we drink now? Yeah. I mean, uh, there's things that we don't know about it. We know that it was made out of out of wheat, right? Or, or not just wheat. It could be made out of oats. It could be made out of, you know, beer is beer. It's not going to be that much different. It may have a little bit of tang because it's been sitting in a barrel and it's a stock ale or whatever. But if you ferment beer with hops, it's going to basically taste like it, like it was. It probably was aged. You don't see fresh beer being drank all that regularly until the mid-19th century. There was some, there's some people, some historians out there that think that table beer was fresh beer. I don't know if I agree with that. But I don't think it's I don't think it would be that that much different than what. I don't know if it would be to our taste what we would think of as beer today, 
as being like, oh, I'm drinking that and I really like that light, refreshing beer, I think it would probably have been heavier. Mm-hmm. It probably would have had some funk in it from some of the wild yeasts and the wood. You know, they open fermented. It probably would be not that different than what you see in farmhouse ales in Belgium and northern France now, right? It's just that European sort of farmhouse saison style. Any other? Uh, yeah? Where was uh, or is the Hedrick? They in North Albany, they in no, uh, Hedrick was out on Central Avenue, so if you go, and I can't think of what the apartment it's complex up, it's is. Up by the, uh, it's up by where the uh, Spring Company that is up on Central Avenue. That's where the old Hedricks used to be. Yeah, there's a... There's a Central Central Towers. Spring up the yeah, Central Towers yeah. in that area. So you had a lot of Germans that were moving into West Albany at the end of the 19th century, going into the 20th century of the railroads opening up. That's why Hedrick opens his brewery out up that way, to supply... The German populations in western Western Albany. Yeah. Are there any plans, at least on a one-off basis, to say resurrect some of the 19th-century beers? Say uh, one brew, not not the strong ale, but I'm talking the earlier Hedricks, the Dobler. Uh, um, you know, that's a big movement right now. So we had done. We, we literally just did one. Sam Pagano over at the pump station is a buddy of mine. Yeah. And we've been doing, I've been working with Maeve McEnany and Discover Albany to do like, we'll go to a historic house and talk about beer in context in that house. Not necessarily that house, but that time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had done an Albany Ale from the 1850s. And they just, they literally just took it off down there. Um, there's a big push, I know, uh, in... Uh, Syracuse, and I know they've done it in Buffalo, uh, a buddy of mine owns a, bu- a brewery in Buffalo, where they uh, resurrected Iroquois uh, brand lager. And I know that they did one in uh, Syracuse for Congress. Um, I would love to do, like, the, the, the really, a really well-known beer prior to um, 1950 around here, probably the most popular, was Beverwick's Irish brand Cream Ale. Nobody that I know of is resurrecting a twenty, an early twentieth century, mid twentieth century cream ale. Um, well, Genesee, Gen- Genesee is Genesee has always had their cream ale, and their cream ale is, uh, and and I don't know if Beverwick was this or not. Right, the Beverwick records are gone uh, because they got bought by Schaefer, and Schaefer got rid of them. Interestingly enough, though, when they discontinued. The Beverwick style cream ale, people around here got mad, and Schaefer, within a year, was reproducing a similar beer. So, cream ale actually plays into the Albany ale thing a little bit, too. In the mid 19th century, cream ale meant something totally different. We're not exactly, we don't exactly know what it meant. It may have meant that the beer had a creamy head, which means it was a little bit more heavily carbonated than earlier, sort of cask style still beers were. We don't know if uh, it had a creamier mouth feel, but we see a lot of advertisements for Taylor's. Cream ale, Albany cream ale, that kind of thing. It is very much a different idea of what cream ale is in the 20th century, which is at the end of the 19th century, brewers started coming up with uh, cold-conditioned lager-like ales, especially the ale breweries, to compete with lager breweries. That's what the Genesee tradition comes out of. Genesee cream ale now is a blend of ale and lager together, a lighter-bodied ale. It's probably what Beverwick was, prior to 1950, but Genesee Cream Ale today is from the mid 1960s That's where that idea, they actually had a beer prior to that that was probably more in line with, a, with an early 20th century, maybe lager-like cold fermented beer, but their records aren't there. So and they, Genesee definitely doesn't want to let us know their records. They want to keep that all proprietary. Browns sometimes has a cream ale. It, yes, and their cream. You do see cream ales now, but there's a lot of di- people put lactic acid in their cream ales, and people sort of it's just sort of a catch-all phrase for a light, cold-conditioned mm-hmm. beer. There's a beer that's gone back for 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 centuries in in Germany around Cologne called Kolsch, which is an ale that is cold-conditioned. Right, that's really what those late 19th century uh, Amsdell made one called Polar, right? Because it was a nod to it being a cold condition ale. They did not have a lager brewing facility. They were all ale. Any other questions? How about a Bach beer? Where, where's that? Where, where? So Bach is um, Bach is sort of the alternative to an Oktoberfest, right? So you have uh, uh, in you have brewing that happens in the winter and in the in the the early spring. 
for beer that is to be drunk in the fall, right? Oktoberfest, Martin beer was sort of created, the festival was sort of created, uh, King Leopold's daughter got married, something like that. <laughs> adverse, adverse to that, where you have brewing done in the fall, for beer to be drank in the spring is the result of a Bach. So Bach is, the, Bach is a kind of beer, but generically it would be called stark beer, which is German for strong beer. Bach is a bit stronger, you know, six and a half, seven percent, and it's traditionally drank in the, in the springtime. But a lot of German breweries in the United States made Bach, like Genesee is another perfect example of that. Genesee has a spring Bach that they put out every spring with a goat on it. And goat, for whatever reason, is the official animal of Bach beer. You see that all over the place. Bach is usually pretty sweet. It's got, it's, 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 it's sort of in line with like a, with a, with a Meritzen or, or an Oktoberfest. It's just a bit stronger. Any other questions? How about a nice round of applause? Oh, Thank you very much. I talked way longer than 20 minutes. Holy cow. Jeez, you're not getting your money back. Well, you know, you didn't see anybody walk out, did you? Right, so no. that's, that's a good thing. I did a, I don't mean, I will tell this last story. I did a, I did a, a beer festival down at the Culinary Institute. Um, and they wanted me to come in and do like these, like sessions on the hour, and it was it was a beer festival, right? You know, and it was like they had food and stuff too. As the as the day went on, I had more and more people just like falling asleep in the front row. Like, all right, come on, you know. Like, so by the third session, I was just like talking and doing whatever because people were literally falling asleep in my. Oh my God. You guys all did good. <laughs> This young lady, I don't know if she's taking notes or right. she's, she's <laughs> filming I'm not, I'm not sure what. <laughs> you don't call my boss, right? <laughs> I think I know who you are, though. Okay. Aha! Yeah. Is that good or bad? That's good, that's good. <laughs> so, a quick... Go nope. ahead. Do you make a living at this event? No! <laughs> <laughs> You say you have a boss. You have a boss. So. I do. I uh, I work for the State Museum. So, but I I don't do this for the State Museum. I'm an exhibition designer for the State Museum. This is uh, the worst hobby ever. Uh, it doesn't pay well. There's no benefits. I do come, get to come out and talk to you with lovely people and talk about beer a lot. So occasionally, occasionally. I will get free beer out of it, but that is... <laughs> oh, by the way, you're in a government agency today. There is no samples here. I'm sorry. <laughs> the county executive frowned upon that when he, when, he, when he found out what we were doing today. He said, no samples for you. <laughs> right. <That counts. laughs> so a quick story of mine. Um, took a trip down to New York City with my wife, and... Um, we did a, a tour of buildings that were ex-breweries, and we went to different places that brewed their own beers. So while we were on this tour, we went past, as you heard Craig talk about Schaefer, which was right down the road here. There was a Schaefer building in New York City that was the original Schaefer building. That was, that the structure is still there, the Schaefer sign is still on the building and everything. So having had a few beers, I decided that I was going to start singing the Schaefer jingle. <laughs> so I broke out and sang the whole Schaefer jingle, and the guy on the tour looked at me and says, I can't believe you remember that. <laughs> but for, for some reason, that has stuck in my head, that Schaefer uh, jingle. But growing, grow, myself growing up in Albany all my life, um, I do remember the Schaefer building here very well. Um, most, of, most of the people that are like 10 or 15 years older than me all worked there. Uh, it was quite the job to have back then. Uh, part, of the, part of the perks was you could actually drink right in the facility. They had a spot for the employees where they could enjoy their, their own beverages that were brewed there. It's a tradition in breweries, actually. That is part of, it, it, it's American breweries, European breweries, to supply their employees with a certain amount of beer. And it's got, I can't think of what, it's got a, an actual term for it, and I can't think of what it is. So that was, that was sort of ubiquitous in the brewing it's industry. Oh shit, in some states though, it's prohibiting that. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you can get away with that now. No. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but uh, 
all those Western people. My uh, great grandfather was a brewmaster in Buffalo, okay. in Niagara Falls. But one of the stories I remember with my grandfather is that they would have pails of beer that they would just bring home and bring to all their friends' houses. Yeah, there's a there was a guy. There was an article in one of the Times Union back in the it must have been the 1950s, recalling the growler man that worked in this neighborhood, and, and the growler man would take a broomstick and put yeah. buckets of beer, and he would go over to the brewery. You go over to Quinn and Nolan, and they would fill it, and then he would go and sell it to the guys that were working in the factories around here. And he would just do that. That's all. He was an old dude, and he was stooped over, and he would just do that over and over and over. That was his job. That's what he did. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want that. <laughs> I just have to have a drink. Yeah. I don't want to drink out of a bucket that somebody else is drinking. Yeah. Out of. yeah that's gross. I just wanted to ask your opinion. What did you think of the tap New York? I've never been to Tap New York. Really? Never been. I think that Dennis, you've been to Tap, right? right? It's good. It's a little crazy. Yeah. I'm not crazy about crowds, so I'm not really not crazy about crowds and booze. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a few standing structures left in the city. Like um, if you go down to where Schaefer was, Schaefer and Beverick. Beverwick is gone. Beverwick was the old brewery that was built by Michael Nolan, who was the mayor in 1870s. They tore that down. Um, but the bottling plant is still there, right? It's the big brick building. They were plans of, to do something with that. Uh, the Knickerbocker Apartments on J&Dove Dove is the old Amstel Brewery. Uh, the, the parking garage was, in fact, that's, there's a blueprint back there for the stables and the, in the coal house. Yeah. Um, if you're just down the road, literally down the road that way, uh, where Stout, the brewery, uh, the, the Stout was uh, the Kirk Brewery, so that, that was built in the 18... 80s, 1890s, but there was an operating brewery at that point from the 1840s. Uh, that's an interesting brewery because, does anybody know who um, David Wilson is? Have you ever heard of the name David Wilson? This is, this is how I usually preface this. What does an Albany brewery have to do with the 2012 Best Picture? Does anybody know what the 2000? So the, the Best Picture in 2012 was 12 Years a Slave. Oh. Oh, and okay. David Wilson was the lawyer that Solomon Northup uh, contacted to help him write his story. Okay. And with the money that Wilson made, he invested in, in huh. Wilson and Company, which eventually became Smith & Walker. He had bought that brewery from Kirk, and it eventually became, and they built that building. Smith & Walker built that building in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the, the Hinkle Brewery Apartments and that whole complex over there which is probably the most intact brewery. Like, if you want to know what a late 19th century Albany brewery, that was a lager brewery, go down on, on, on Park Avenue. And there's a whole bunch, bunch of stuff happening down there now, too. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any place else. I think that's it. Uh, right, that's I was the look out, Carol. Yeah. Uh, right. For Dobler, right. And then the bottling plant. Well, Hinkle. Hankel built that brewery, right? That was a brewery there starting in the 18, early 1850s. And then they, they built the main, the building that's there now in the 1880s. They go out of business because of prohibition. Dobler is right across the street where the mansion view or executive view apartments, that's where it was. Yeah. They survived prohibition and they've got a facility that's, that's ready to be moved into. So in the 1940s, they move into, 19, late 1930s, early 1940s, they yeah, take over. I lived over. next to the brewery, Dober, Dober, yeah. from 1948 till its demise yeah. in 59. I can say I've had Dober as a kiss. My father. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually have what I hope is a bottle still in my house. Yeah. I don't know who filtered it and how they filtered it, but I have a sealed bottle of Dobler. Dobler got kicked, was, oh. kicked there, was kicking around too. They get bought by the same company that built, bought um, Hedrick in the 60s. So the, na the brands keep going, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's what happens in the mid-20th mid century is you have this consolidation and you have this, right? So the buildings and the breweries themselves don't mean anything. It's just the brands right. that you want. Paps is a perfect example of this. Paps owns like 25 heritage brands. They own Schaefer, they own... Uh, I don't know if they own Rheingold, but they own those sort of traditional mid-20th century regional breweries. Rainier, they own a whole bunch of them. Pabst Blue Ribbon, you know. It's amazing how Pabst Blue Ribbon, it, it just went away, and, and now all of a sudden it's back, yeah. and, and, and it's really a popular beer again. 
I mean, Utica Club in in from Matt's in Utica, right? That that brewery has been family owned and independently owned since the 1880s. You know, uh, the brewery started in the 1850s, was bought by the Matt family in 1880, 1888 is when they really start getting stuff going. Um, they were instrumental in the craft brewing world too because they started contract brewing. You had people that couldn't make, they had recipes, but they could only make it at a small scale. They went to Matt, Matt would make it at a large scale and they could make, everybody could make some money. If it wasn't for that contract, Matt probably would have gone the way of a lot of breweries. Matt's beer balls oh, yeah. were in many dorms <laughs> yeah. for, as, as lights. <laughs> And they just, not too long ago, they released, uh, like, Utica Club post-prohibition 1934-1935 beer cans with Utica Club in it, and, uh, what did they put, they, they did, they did three or four of them that were, like, there was a red can, a white can, and a blue can, so. And the Utica Club jingle was on the uh, jukebox of the Pelé Royale. They grew me with all the Pelé Royale. Many beers of today. I had to learn that in college. Uh, had to. Had to. I was on the team. There were some requirements. There may have been some beer drunk. Uh -oh. When I was growing up, two, two quick things. One, well, my dad moved out of Albany to Rensselaer County, so we'd have to go across the Dunn Memorial. For some reason, we would always go past the Schaefer Brewery every single time. He would point out on the arch that linked the two buildings, Gambrius, yeah. the Roman god of yeah. good times. So that statue still exists. That statue, when they tore the building down, went out to the Lehigh Valley thing. So maybe five years ago, we, my folks lived down in South Carolina, so we were taking the kids down there on our, on our annual trip, and we go by the brewery. So I said, hey. I want to go and see the King Gambrinus from, you know, Schaefer, or from Beverly, because Michael Nolan was really the one who wanted that there. That was a popular thing to do at the end of the 19th century, was to have King Gambrinus on your brewery. So we drive all the way over there, and I go up, and I go to, let's say, guardhouse, and I'm like, standing around, and there's guys with guns. Like, literally, there's guys with guns at this guardhouse. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm from Albany, New York, you have King, you have King Gambrinus, it was on one of our breweries, I'd love to go in and see it. And the guy's like, yeah, no, you're never getting it. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, you got to know somebody. And, it's a bit. and I was like, this is a brewery. What is it? Like, it was locked down like Fort Knox. I was amazed <laughs> by that. But I have seen pictures of it. Uh, Kathy Quinn, who is related to the Quinn of Quinn and Nolan, uh, they made a pilgrimage out there to see it over the summer. And she sent me a photograph. So Kathy was Kathy. She knew something. She knew something. Well, they contacted. You know, I think she went with Jack Mackin and he actually, too. So he made it. Mm -hmm. The second half of my question, my oh, dad yes. always swore that Hedrick's was the worst beer and he'd always get a headache. So, there is some truth, <laughs> not necessarily to that, but there is some truth. You, there, is a, there is an adage that if you didn't have Hedrick in your bar, you couldn't get a license to operate. In the 19, late, uh, when did Dewey run? 1948. But that was, the, he ran, he ran for governor. For governor. So it must have been it must have been the late thirties. And he's a he's stumping in Buffalo. And he's talking about the Democratic machines at Albany and Brooklyn. And he actually brings that up. He actually says, and that's sort of the I don't know if it was the impetus of where that came from, but he is now publicly saying that across the state that if you didn't have Hedrick Beer in your in your bar, you couldn't, you know. So that was nice to see confirmation on that. Because I'd heard it from a lot of people. And I'd also heard that it was pretty universally bad. <laughs> which you wonder why it was universally bad? Oh, well, that's why. Yes. Yeah, so How did those breweries manage to stay open still during Prohibition? Well, I thought they would have been. Seventy-five percent of you, them closed. You said that there were some that remained open. Right. Well, like I said, the one uh, Dobler got purchased by a larger brewery. They closed that brewery in Newark, and they kept Albany opening, making near beer. If you go back into the exhibit, there's a thing that talks oh, about prohibition, where they get licenses to produce vinegar or ice cream oh, or okay. um, cereal yeah. beverages. Yes, oh, cereal right. beverages. Hedrick, oh, that's, that's the reason good. that Hedrick, that, that the O'Connells <laughs> get Hedrick, is because there were guys that buy the brewery and they say that they're going to make some sort of apple malt drink there. And they obviously were not doing that. They were bootlegging. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so they get pinched by prohibition officers, and they are defended by this gentleman by 
John Conway. And has anybody ever read uh, the book Roscoe by Bill Kennedy? So Roscoe is based on Conway. And what Conway does is Conway takes the brewery in lieu of payment. And the O'Connells, because Conway and the O'Connells were buddies, they essentially operate the brewery during Prohibition. And then like within a, like a month of Prohibition being repealed, O'Connell buys the brewery outright. And then they operated until the mid-1960s. Do you still run your blog? Not too much anymore. I stopped, I stopped writing. I just got too busy. And uh, I, I still do stuff with Alan. We run a Facebook page. So if you go look for the Albany Ale Project on Facebook, that's the majority of the stuff that pops up that I find I, I put on Facebook. Now I get a bigger audience. I, I, can, I, don't, have, I don't have a way to track who reads my blog and who doesn't read the blog. But on Facebook, I know who's reading my 